Our scripture reading uh, comes from 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 38 through 44. We return to our regular sermon series in the books of 1 and 2 Kings. And this morning we come to 2 Kings 4, 38 through 44. Please listen now as I read, for this is the very Word of God. And Elisha came again to Gilgal when there was a famine in the land. And as the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, he said to his servant, set on the large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. One of them went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered from it his lap full of wild gourds and came and cut them up into the pot of stew, not knowing what they were. And they poured out some for the men to eat. But while they were eating of the stew, they cried out, O man of God, there is death in the pot. And they could not eat it. He said, Then bring flour. And he threw it into the pot and said, Pour some out for the men that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. A man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing the man of God bread from the first fruits, twenty loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. And Elisha said, Give to the men that they may eat. But his servant said, How can I set this before a hundred men? So he repeated, Give them to the men, that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, They shall eat and have some left. So he set it before them, and they ate and had some left, according to the word of the Lord. May the Lord bless to our hearts and minds the reading of his word, and you may be seated. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we pray that by the power of your Spirit, your Word would go forth with power, with clarity, that you would grant us understanding, and also that you would grant us faith, and you would grant us strength to not only believe, but to obey. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I saw a news report this past week, maybe you saw it as well, that according to a recent survey, seven out of ten people think the U.S. is headed in the wrong direction. Now, I would, I don't know for sure, but I would hazard to guess that a large percentage of the three out of ten who like where the country is going, they do so because they take issue with where the country has been or is now. Which means, if you add it all up, that pretty close to 10 out of 10 people think there's something wrong with the society in which we live. It seems that regardless of your political persuasion, most folks agree there's something wrong. Something wrong with where we've been. Something wrong with where we are. Something wrong with where we're headed. There's something wrong with our system of politics and government something wrong with the entertainment industry and all it produces, something wrong with the educational system, something wrong with our financial, business, economic systems. No, make no mistake, everyone can see that there is definitely something wrong. Now, of course, we don't all agree on the precise nature or definition of the problem. Some would say, well, the problem is clearly capitalism. We need to move in a more socialist direction in order to right the inequities of the past. Others would say, no, the problem is uh, the rise of a kind of neo-Marxist cultural totalitarianism. The country needs to return to its political roots. Some would argue that the problem is that government is too big, it's too unwieldy, too corrupt, too powerful. Others would say the problem is that government isn't big enough. We need, it needs more power in order to effectively mandate and dictate the right behaviors, in order to ensure that resources are allocated in an equitable and just manner. Some would argue that the problem is systemic racism that touches every part of our society. Others would say, no, the problem is critical race theory and its manifold offshoots. And we could go on and on. And most days in our society, we do go on and on. 
We're subjected to these kinds of debates every day in the news media. And I think many folks would agree with respect to the news media, there's definitely something wrong there as well. Now, we may not agree on the precise nature of the problem, but in so many ways, it seems that we do agree that there's something wrong. There's a kind of poison that has seeped in and infected life all around us. It seems to touch every aspect of our lives. And in the face of this kind of pervasive wrong, we wonder, well, then where can we turn to make things right? Some might ask, is it even possible to make things right? Well, this morning, with these kinds of questions and concerns stirring in our hearts, we turn to a most unlikely setting and scene to consider the great solution to our deepest social and personal problems. Now, this unlikely setting is Gilgal, a little settlement outside of Jericho in the land of Israel in the days of Elijah about 3,000 years ago. The scene is a group of hungry prophets with few good options for food. Again, it's an unlikely place to find solutions to our deepest problems, but I ask that you would come with me as we consider the scene together. As we come to the end of 2 Kings 4, we read that Elisha came again to Gilgal where the, when there was a famine in the land and the sons of the prophets were sitting before him. Now, as we consider these verses and the two rather remarkable things that Elisha will do here in these verses, we first need to consider the context of the passage. And I think we need to consider this context at two levels. First, we have to consider the kind of immediate literary and historical context as we find it in First and Second Kings. I remind you that Elisha lived and ministered in some very hard days. Days when there was most certainly something wrong with life in Israel. Elisha lived uh, during the days of Ahab and Jezebel, when the nation of Israel had turned away, wholesale turned away from the Lord and devoted themselves to the worship of Baal and Asherah. These were Canaanite fertility gods. In their days, Ahab and Jezebel persecuted the prophets, oppressed the weak, and generally did whatever they wanted to do. It was during these times that the Lord raised up Elijah to be a prophet of the Lord. And you may remember, we read back in 1 Kings 19, that in in addition to Elijah, the Lord also preserved 7,000 in Israel who did not bend the knee to Baal. Now that number... 7,000 gives us some indication of the hard road that was trod by the people of God in those days. In all the land of Israel, a population in the hundreds and hundreds of thousands, there were only 7,000 who remained faithful to the Lord. Now, many of these 7,000, as we see in subsequent chapters, were organized and led by the sons of the prophets. These men had followed Elijah and Under his leadership, they formed a kind of prophetic band where they were devoted to Elijah's ministry, and together they worked to remain faithful to the law of God. Now, back in 2 Kings 2, in the midst of these hard days, the Lord, in his providence, took Elijah up to heaven. And the Lord then appointed and anointed Elisha to serve as prophet in Elijah's place. Elisha then became the spiritual leader of the faithful throughout Israel. He became the leader of the sons of the prophets as they sought to lead and teach those who were endeavoring to be faithful to the Lord, endeavoring to be faithful under godless rulers and amidst a godless people. Elisha, you may remember, actually began his public ministry in the, in the area around Gilgal and Jericho. There he removed a curse on the water of that region as his first act of public ministry. And now we see that Elisha has gone again to Gilgal. The sons of the prophets have gathered to him there, and together they are in great need. They are in need because, once again, as we read, there is famine in the land. 
Now, I say once again because you may remember that back in the days of Elijah, under wicked king Ahab, the Lord brought a devastating famine on the land by the word of Elijah. There was no rain in the land for years. And now here we read that in the days of Elisha, there is famine in the land once again. Now, we don't know much about this particular famine, but I, but I think we can say with confidence that this famine is a sign that the land is once again under the judgment of God. Because God has said in His Word on multiple occasions, passages like Leviticus 26 or Deuteronomy 28, that if the people of Israel disobeyed His Word, disregarded His law, He would bring famine to their land. So in the days of Ahab, there was great wickedness in the land, and so God brought a great famine. Ahab had died... But Israel had continued on the same path of rebellion and idolatry under the leadership of Ahab's sons. So it should come as no surprise to any observer that the land of Israel continued to suffer under drought and famine. And what we see here is that the famine affects everyone, even Elisha and the faithful sons of the prophets. And that's the context here in 2 Kings. But in addition to this immediate literary context, I think there's also a larger picture that we need to consider. Because this this little snapshot of Israel's history is part of a much larger story. A story that, if we are to fully understand it, takes us back to the beginning. We read in Genesis 1 and 2 that God created the man and the woman and He blessed them with every good gift. He put them in the Garden of Eden in a good and pleasant land, and there He gave them every good plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. He said, you shall have them all for food. You see, the man and the woman lived in great abundance, great goodness, showered with great blessing under the lordship and rule of God. Now, there was one condition to all of this. They they had to obey God. They had to keep His word. And they were warned that if they disobeyed God's word, they would surely die, but that in obedience they would live and flourish. Of course, as, as we know, tragically, the man and the woman chose to disobey God. As a result, God cursed them in judgment. Every part of their lives was affected by this curse. And as part of this curse, we read in Genesis, they were driven out of the land of Eden, out of the land of blessing, out of the land of abundant provision, and now the ground on which they walked was cursed. In fact, God said to the man, cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the fields, but by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. You see, the man and the woman had been created in order to live in God's blessing, enjoying God's abundant provision in the Garden of Eden and holiness and fellowship with God, but in disobedience... The man and the woman found themselves now exiled from God's presence, walking and living on cursed ground, eating from the ground in toil and pain and marching to inevitable death. But at that very moment of curse, God also stayed His hand in mercy. He could have brought immediate death on the man and the woman, but He did not. Though he pronounced a curse of judgment upon them, he also gave them a promise, a promise of a redeemer, a promise of one who would come and ultimately remove the curse. We see throughout the Old Testament this promise fueled the hope of Adam and Eve and their descendants. An example of this is found in Genesis 5.29. When, when Noah was born, his father said, out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, This one shall bring us relief from our work and the painful toil of our hands. And this hope reached a new level in Genesis 12 when God called Abraham and made a promise to him. He promised to make Abraham into a great nation, a great people. He promised to put this people in its its own promised land 
where God would bless them and then make them a source of blessing to all the nations. Eventually, we read in the Scriptures that God raised up Israel. He delivered them out of bondage in Egypt, and He brought them into the promised land of Canaan, a land that was good and abundant, a land that the text says flowed with milk and honey. And so you see, in so so many ways, Israel coming into the land of promise was the the restoration of Eden. It was a picture of God's people living in God's place, enjoying the blessing of God's presence as they lived under the authority of God's Word. And just like Eden, just like in Eden, God set before Israel the paths of life and death. He told them that if they would obey His Word and keep His law, He would bring them blessing in the land of promise. He would give them abundant provision and welfare and peace, but he warned them if they disobeyed his word, if they cast off his law, he would bring on them the curses of judgment. As we've already mentioned, they would experience famine and conflict and death. The people of Israel, they, they accepted this offer. They embraced the challenge and they marched into the promised land under the mighty hand of God. And when they entered into the promised land, the first place they set up camp was Gilgal. You see, Gilgal was a kind of home base, a kind of ground zero, you might say, for the great project of Israel dwelling in the land of promise, the new Eden under the blessing of God. And all that story lays in the background as Elisha now sits with the sons of the prophets in Gilgal, with famine in the land. You see, Israel has once again turned aside from the God of the promised land. They'd rejected the Lord, cast off His word, and embraced the Baals. And as a result now, the land of milk and honey had become a parched and dry land. The land of holy blessing had become the cursed land of judgment. And the great people of God had now been kind of whittled down to a a faithful remnant with Elisha and the sons of the prophets and the the 7,000. And now, quite simply, those sons of the prophets needed to eat. But there was little to no food in the land. Things Things are dire. What can be done? Well, Elijah tells his servant, set on a large pot, boil stew for the sons of the prophets. Now, this seems to be a, a relatively hopeful command. <laughs> there really isn't much supply. It doesn't seem that there's a, enough for a large stew that will feed many, but the servant follows Elisha's command. The pot gets heated up while someone goes out to gather herbs and ingredients for the stew. Then we read that one of them finds a wild vine and gathers up in his lap many wild gourds, as many as he can carry. Seems to be a remarkable provision. He comes back to the camp, he cuts up the gourds, not knowing where they were, but then again, beggars can't really be choosers, can they? They cook up the stew, they pour it out for the men to eat, and the response is unanimous. They cry out with one voice, O man of God, there is death in the pot. And they could not eat it. The obvious implication is that the wild gourds were poisonous, and they're Their toxic nature came through immediately in their taste. There was death in the pot, so much so that starvation was better than eating this stew. But what we need to see here is that this moment is far deeper than one bad bowl of soup. This is a moment of deep and great tragedy in the biblical story. You see, it's not just a single pot of stew that is bad. In many ways, it's the entire project of God's people living in God's place. I mean, here we see what's supposed to be the the new Garden of Eden, the promised land of Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey, and it has become a poisonous death trap. There's nothing to eat. There's no good food in the land, and and the cursed ground yields up these poisonous vines which lead to death in the pot. And this toxic stew 
is really, I think, intended to be a picture of the whole land of Israel and the people of Israel. In fact, the later prophets, Ezekiel in particular, Ezekiel 24, will describe the nation of Israel as a toxic stew where choice meats and ingredients are put into the pot, but the result is a poisonous concoction of death. And as Elisha serves up this dreadful stew, it's a sign that something is very, very wrong in Israel. The systems of government are corrupt. Violence rules the land. The people suffer in scarcity and want. And we say, well, how did it get to this point? How did it come to the point where this kind of wild, poisonous vine is all that is available to eat in the land? Well, for Israel, the answer was very simple. They had turned from the Lord. Just like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, they had broken the covenant. They had rejected the law of God. They had rejected the Lord who gave them that law. They had worshipped other gods. And as a result of their sin, a poison had seeped into their souls. It had corrupted the heart of the nation. It had corrupted every part of their social fabric. And now it seemed like there was no way out, right? A starving people in a famished land with no other option but poisonous stew with death in the pot. We consider our world today and we say, well, the more things change, the more they stay the same. I would suggest to you that in all our problems today, All our manifold corruptions and frustrations, all our poisonous social evils, they all have at the root one core problem. And that is that that we all, individually and corporately, have turned from the Lord who made us. We've rejected His Word, disobeyed His law. The Scriptures very bluntly calls this sin. In sin, we've rejected God's sovereign rule. Instead, we've done what is right in our own eyes. And so we should not be surprised when our own souls and our life together is infected, poisoned with the toxic reality of sin. This is our ultimate problem. This is the root of the death in our pot. Well, what then can be done about it? What can be done about a problem so pervasive and deep? Well, Elisha steps forward to render a solution to the death in the pot. He calls for some flour. He throws it in the pot and says, pour out some for the men that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. The poison was remedied by the flour of Elisha. We say, well, that's very interesting. But what is that supposed to mean? I mean, we're not supposed to go around throwing flour at the great social evils of the day, are we? I think it means a couple of things. First, it shows that the ultimate remedy for the problem is supernatural. I mean, there's no natural explanation for the healing of the stew. It wasn't a matter of, oh, you you forgot the flour. You got to add that in. The great prophet of the Lord here demonstrates that only a supernatural remedy can cure a problem, a poison, a curse so deep. But cure it, it can, and cure it, it does. And we say, well, how is that then to work itself out in in reality, right? How, How do you cure the toxic death of Israel? I would argue it is through the leavening power of the ministry of the Word. The very ministry that the sons of the prophets had been called to engage in. No, make no mistake. The nation was cursed, ravished by famine, and rendered toxic because the people had rejected the Word of the Lord. The only hope then would be healing that would come through the ministry of the word of the Lord. The very ministry that these men were called to engage in. And yet, for these men, their ministry seems so small, right? So insignificant. 
I mean, what could this weak band of brothers do against the forces of evil that are so great? What could these very few sons of the prophets do against the toxic systems of Israel's corporate life? Well, they could preach the word. They could preach the word. They could cast the leaven of God's word into the poisonous stew of Israel's life. And by the power of God and by the power of his supernatural word, the nation could be healed. But, but then you say, well, I mean, well, how are these sons of the prophets themselves to be sustained? I mean, the famine still remained in the land. Then the situation was hard and their own need was great. Well, this brings us then to the second great act that Elisha performed here in these verses. We read that a, a man came from, from Baal Shalisha, which means Baal is Lord over this region. And he came to Elisha out of that territory and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. A couple of things about this gift, right? These were probably just pretty small loaves. But in these circumstances, with famine in the land, this was a most generous gift. The man probably did not have abundant storehouses of grain sitting at home. He was surely giving out of sacrificial generosity and not abundant surplus. And he gave this gift to Elisha, it seems with great intentionality, right? Because the gift of the first fruits, that was prescribed in the law to go to the priests as part of one's offering at the tabernacle. But it seems here that the man knows that the priesthood has been so deeply corrupted in Israel. The temples are dedicated to Baal and the golden calves of Jeroboam. So this faithful brother, it seems, brings his offering to the leader of the faithful remnant. He brings his offering to Elisha that he might make a humble offering in order to supply the needs of the sons of the prophets who are the true source of true ministry in the land. And Elisha then immediately directs his servant to set the loaves before the sons of the prophets. Seems the redeemed stew wasn't quite enough to feed all these men into perpetuity. So so he says, feed these men with this gift. But Elisha's servant says, "Uh, how can I set this before a hundred men? I mean, come on, Elisha, right? It's It's a nice gift and all. I mean, I'm sure it really cost this guy, but it's just not nearly enough. You can't feed a hundred men and probably their families along with them with 20 small loaves and some some handfuls of grain and corn. But Elisha continues, Give it to the men that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left. And so the servant sets the loaves before them and they eat And have some left, according to the word of the Lord. You see, the supernatural ministry of the word of the Lord is the only thing that can ultimately heal the diseased nation of Israel. And the Lord promises he will supernaturally sustain that ministry. He will provide for the needs of the sons of the prophets. He will multiply the generous gifts of the faithful people of God in order to provide for the faithful ministers of God. And all of this was surely not lost on the sons of the prophets. These brief episodes were clearly meant to encourage and sustain these men in the challenging work that God had called them to. Here, you might say, was supernatural fuel for the fire. It was a reminder that their humble work could be effective in bringing healing to the nation. And their humble work would be sustained, even in the darkest of times. And so they were encouraged to press on. And press on they did. And yet, as we will see as we continue to study 2 Kings, there was was no great miraculous revival in the land of Israel. The Word of God was faithfully preached through the ministry of the prophets, 
But the people of God continued to rebel against that word. So the land grew more and more toxic. The poison of sin continued to seep down into every crack and crevice of Israel's corporate life until the nation itself was destroyed and carried off into exile. And yet, through it all, God supernaturally sustained a faithful witness. And through that faithful witness, he preserved a faithful remnant. And that continued throughout the Old Testament. It continued until the day when a new prophet stepped onto the scene. Now this prophet came following in the footsteps of the new Elijah, John the Baptist. And he came preaching a word of healing, deliverance, and forgiveness from the awful, toxic power of sin. And at the heart of his ministry of the word was testimony about himself. You see, he not only came calling people to turn from their sin and turn to the Lord, but he called people to turn to him. And he announced that he would supernaturally deliver God's people from the power of sin. And he would do this through his own life and death and resurrection. Because you see, this prophet came not just to fix external systems, but he came to remove the very curse of sin itself. And he did this by bearing the awful curse of sin the curse that we deserved, he came bearing that sin in his own body on the cross. And Scripture says that he suffered and died for us, for all our sin, for all the ways we sin against others, for all the ways we have been afflicted by the ways others have sinned against us. Jesus paid it all. And this prophet... This Jesus, this great Savior, he not only died, but he rose from the grave, victorious over sin, victorious over the root cause of all our troubles, and victorious over all of sin's toxic effects. And now this Jesus, he calls his people, those who believe in him, to go into all the world and to make disciples of all nations through the ministry of his word. For it is this supernatural word of the gospel that can heal the sin-sick soul. It is through the supernatural word of the gospel that God will ultimately make all things new. It is through the supernatural word of the gospel that God will bring about the redemption of creation itself and the establishing of the new heavens and the new earth. Now, of course, as we look around today, we say this... This challenge seems enormous, even foolish. Where will the resources come to execute such a mission? But Jesus promises he will be with us, and he will provide for all our needs. And if we doubt that, we can look at the way he demonstrated his divine powers of supernatural provision when, when he himself, as the greater Elisha, fed not a hundred, but five thousand, and then turned around and fed four thousand with just a few fish and loaves. And in both cases, there was more than enough left over. And so it shall be with the church of Jesus Christ. As we commit ourselves to the cause of Christ's gospel as we endeavor to proclaim his living and active word concerning his death and resurrection. And it is through this that the healing of the nations will come. And in all our trials and in all our want and in all our need, physical, emotional, spiritual, God will supply. The Lord Jesus himself will feed his people. He will provide for our needs. He will enable us to persevere and endure until he calls us home. Our challenge this morning is to believe it. To believe that the word of the gospel is the only ultimate hope for this sin-sick world. 
Now make no mistake, right? I enjoy political debate. I think there are better political systems and worse political systems. And by all means, I would prefer to live in the better ones. But I do not believe for one moment that politics of any kind can ultimately cure the poison that eats away at the human soul. Politics cannot remove the death in the pot. They just figure out better ways to stir it. And I tell you, I am not depending on any political leaders to ultimately supply the needs of God's people. For there is only one who can heal, only one who can save. There is only one who can and will make all things new. There is only one who can provide for my needs and your needs in this life and in the life to come. And he is the new Elisha, the man of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, crucified and risen, who fed his people on the mountainsides of Galilee, and he feeds his people today by the power of his word and spirit. As the old hymn says, though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. And Jesus who died will be satisfied and earth and heaven be one. So let us trust him, brothers and sisters. Let us follow him. Let us sacrificially give to support the work of his gospel, and let us press on, trusting in Christ, resting in Christ, holding up the banner of Christ, sending forth his word into this sin-sick world, knowing that the Savior has come, And he is coming again. And he comes with eternal healing in his wings. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, there are many good gifts in this world. They come from you. Help us to never worship the gifts instead of the giver. Help us first and foremost to turn to you as the Savior of our souls and let us hold up the banner of Christ for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we can and must be saved. So we pray that you would give us the grace even as we come to this table to embrace the sufficient power of Christ to heal the sin-sick soul, to heal the sin-sick world. And we pray you would strengthen us in this faith. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.